Today in Across the Fence, we're looking back at another great year. From stories about Lake Champlain and research at UVM to the outstanding work of Vermont's 4-H'ers. Good afternoon and thanks for joining us. I'm Judy Simpson. It's hard to believe another year is coming to a close. Over the next couple of days, our reporters will reflect on 2018. And up first is Rebecca Gollin. Thanks so much for coming in. Thanks for having me, Judy. Now, there really is no typical across the fence story, is there? There is nothing no such thing as a typical <laughs> across the fence story. We cover research, we cover agriculture, we cover innovation, 4-H master gardener. I could go on, but we don't have all day. Um, so this year, I wanted to talk about some youth who had really inspired me over the year. One group of students that I met last year from the University of Vermont are working together to help their fellow classmates start businesses. Do we like the number of six? Do we want to increase it to get, you know? There's a new resource for the University of Vermont's up-and-coming entrepreneurs. The Catamount Innovation Fund is UVM's first student-run venture catalyst program. Medical student Al Marquez is one of the co-founders of the Catamount Innovation Fund. We provide a lot of resources in terms of workspace, uh, funding for prototype development. Uh, we have workshops led by local members of the startup community. Uh, and at the end, teams will be rewarded with money to help them reach their next and final milestone uh, in the accelerator program. In the first year of the program, 24 teams applied and six were selected. Those who participated had a variety of business ideas and products ranging in stages of development. They're here at UBM's Davis Center to share the culmination of their work for the year in a demo day. So why not make a bigger stress on collaboration while we're still in school? Offering students a real-world experience while they're still in school is invaluable. This offering is filling the need of how can we keep those students who, on the one hand, want to learn about entrepreneurship but, and want a real live experience. It's one thing to watch Shark Tank on TV, it's another thing to be the shark in the room actually making the decisions about who gets the funding to go forward. Eric Munson is the faculty advisor for the group. He's been impressed with the progress he's seen the teams make over the year. On the one hand, the analysts are people who are interested in entrepreneurship, uh, but they're not ready to take the dive just yet. So it gives them a lot of experience on the investment side of the table and the decision making the training side of the table very valuable skills, but there's this other cohort of students, the folks we saw tonight, who had ideas and were ready to run with those ideas this year. Now, most startups are not lucky enough to have a resource like the Catamount Innovation Fund. So what's the next step for a budding entrepreneur? For students who are starting businesses, that's often a business pitch competition where they can present their ideas and compete for money and other prizes. I went to one of those competitions at University of Vermont last year and met some of Vermont's newest entrepreneurs. So we're looking for the people that are out there that might be willing to purchase our tool to then decrease their labor costs, save them money. So we're gonna be These college to students are talking business because they're business owners. So my company's name is Beach It. We are the Airbnb for, for beach parking. The students have come to the University of Vermont to compete in a business pitch competition. It's the college edition of a contest called Launch BT. Oh, we're going through the patent process now, so we uh, anticipate a preliminary patent um, before our full-scale patent once we've refined our design. Um, from there, we Partners Manny Aratakis and Jack Beauperlant hope that their sweet gadget will speak to the judges. Beauperlant, who was a Vermont Maple Ambassador in 2016, came up with the idea. I'm an experienced maple sugar maker in the state of Vermont. I saw a need with uh, tubing installations and applying spouts to uh, maple sap tubing and also other fittings in the, in the industry and uh, just saw a need to create a tool that was a little more efficient uh, for the sugar makers in the state and around New England. Communities are built by entrepreneurs and small business owners and we need more of them. John Antonucci is the director of entrepreneurship at the Lake Champlain Regional Chamber of Commerce who sponsored the event. We award the winners over $100,000 in cash and in-kind services. And then three years ago, we started LaunchVT Collegiate to give entrepreneurs uh, across Vermont's colleges an opportunity to compete for cash prizes. And the winner of LaunchVT Collegiate goes on to compete in LaunchVT. 
Well, starting a business is one way for students to learn how to tackle difficult tasks while working toward a goal. But you found a class at UVM that helps first-year students learn how to problem solve in a very different way. That's right, Judy. Sometimes I just hear about a class or something going on at UVM that is just different and cool, and I just have to cover it. And that was the case with this biology class that I went to at UVM, where students are taught to think way outside the box. We have been assigned to provide an environment for plankton that they can eat algae. It's a biology class, but with a twist. We saw a real place for this sort of maker movement in biology, not to necessarily do biological experiments, but to build equipment to do experiments. It's called BioFab Lab, and it's offered to first year, first semester students who want to explore a biology or life science major. Much of their work is done here at The Generator, a makerspace in Burlington where the students learn how to use 3D printers, laser cutters, and other specialized machines to create their designs. Andy Mead teaches the class. The idea of the class is to expose those students to a side of doing science that they wouldn't get exposed to until much later in the process. It's sort of a kind of creative side of doing science. No, it's got to, well, it's got to be the same because these all have to be total length of exactly the same, right? Mead says that often, when a researcher wants to do an experiment, they must first construct a dedicated piece of equipment to be able to continue. The projects being created here are more than just an exercise. These devices are needed by labs right here at UBM. Right now, um, I've actually got an experiment going on where I'm looking at the impact of elevated temperature on the different life history stages of copepods. Lauren Ashlock is getting her PhD in biology. Her focus is evolutionary biology, specifically the tiny crustaceans called copepods that are stored in these bins. Ashlock realized that a new piece of equipment could help with her experiments. Time and resources are huge. You know, it costs money for the materials, but also um, for the expertise in, you know, uh, laser cutting and 3D printing and all of these things that I'm certainly not an expert in. So I was able to continue with the research I'm doing now, knowing that they're making this awesome tool for me to do an experiment in the future. And of course, a major component of education today involves technology. And you covered a number of 4-H stories that are centered on high tech, including a 4-H camp that puts the kids in control. I did. This one was so cool, too. It was a 4-H camp focused on drone technology, um, and it introduced campers to those different technologies, as well as some of the general safeties and risks involved in using that type of craft. The campers were pretty into it, to say the least. There's a hiker lost in the woods. A drone has been deployed to help the search and rescue team on the ground find him. Go 10 paces forward. Luckily, they locate him just a few minutes later and are able to deliver critical supplies. Found him. Perfect. Come on back. Tell him to stay there. Give him the bug I'll spray. stay here. Give him the bug spray. Thank you, Tyler. Give him the bug spray, please. It's just another day at drone camp. I heard the words drone and camp together, that immediately got me interested and then my parents explained it to me like we'd be flying drones, learning about how to make maps and how to use the drones to do more than just leisurely fly around. So I thought that was pretty interesting. Uh, yesterday you learned that you can actually make maps. With the camp is being held at the University of Vermont and it's focused on introducing these campers to different types of drone technology as well as general safety and risks involved in using that type of craft. My first thoughts before coming to drone camp was just like flying the drone around and just having a good time, which is also what we did. But we got to learn more about the actual drones, like the EB and the Phantom and uh, the Bebops. You can attempt to land in the box for bonus points. Uh, oh well. After the search and rescue and obstacle course, staff from the UVM Spatial Analysis Lab, who are leading the camp, took data and imagery of the UVM campus. They then went into the computer lab to teach the campers how to download those images and make maps. You can make detailed maps, like you can build things 
using drones to do the layout. Because, for example, like when we used the Phantom to take pictures of Southwick Hall, we did that, well, we broke up into four groups and each group did it. And then on the 3D model, we were able to take measurements of it and see like the arc, the X, Y, and Z. It's really about helping youth find their spark by providing opportunities um, for kids to find something that they're passionate about or interests and we're trying to expose them to those opportunities. So did you like it? Yeah, <laughs> I really enjoyed this camp. It was a lot of fun. I liked everything so far. The counselors were fun. All the professional drone flyers, they were all fun and easy to work with because they made it easy to work with. So it was a very good experience flying and watching drones fly. So that was good camp. Well, that was a fun camp. It really was. I was incredibly jealous. <laughs> um, those kids had a great time. And the one thing that really impresses me about 4-H is how many different learning opportunities they present. There was an event that I went to last winter where 4-Hers learned about different careers in agriculture. These high school students are interested in careers in the agriculture industry. They came to hear from the experts. Today here at the Davis Center at the University of Vermont, we are having our Agricultural Career Day where we have professionals coming in and giving a five-minute presentation about who they are, what they do, the value of the education that they had, and advice that they would give to students and 4-H members that came today. Speakers included professionals from feed companies, equine and dairy farm management, agronomy, and food manufacturing, among others. Everyone offered some good tips. I came here to just like learn my options for careers later in life. I don't, I'm not really sure like what I'm going to do, but just to like keep doors open. I don't know if I really want to be a full-time dairy farmer, but that's why I came here to figure out other options besides just working full-time on a dairy farm. Today, I just really wanted to learn more about where I can go with it, like whether or not really going into horses as like a trainer or something would be as um, involving as going into something like food and like water services and all those sort of things. It was really just like so I could learn more about the industry itself, how diverse it is. So a big part of 4-H is for members to share the work that they've done and enter competitions. And it's really always fun to go to those competitions and see what the kids are mastering, from stage performances and team projects to showing their animals in the ring. The kids that win those competitions go on to bigger ones, like the Big E in Springfield, Massachusetts. We were able to go down there again this year, and we caught up with some 4-Hers that we had met throughout the year and some new faces. My name is Jonathan Flores Torres and I live in Addison, Vermont. Jonathan, what is it that you were doing or participating in down here at the Big E? I am participating in the dairy show with my two-year-old cow. And what is it you need to do in the dairy show with your cow? I need to show her off the best of her abilities. They're down here representing Vermont, Vermont 4-H, Vermont Extension uh, to the best of their abilities and we've had a successful weekend with their endeavors. I'm Chandra Stanley and I'm from Franklin, Vermont. I've been participating in the 4-H dairy project. Um, I've been working for about a year on a heifer that I've grown since she was born and now I get to show it here for 4-H. So what kind of work did you have to put in to get to this point? Well, I've had to raise her, so I've had to feed her twice a day. I've had to take care of her, and I've also had to train her to lead and stuff to be able to bring her into the ring. Yesterday we had confirmation, which was uh, judging about the animal and how they're grown. Today it's about showmanship, which is how I present my animal, how I clipped her and made her look nice, and how we work together. So tell us a little bit more about showmanship. What kind of work did you have to do to get here? And then what kind of work did you have to do to win that blue ribbon that's in your hand? So we all go to State Day, which is in August, middle of August, and we all participate in showmanship and confirmation. And they choose, you have to get top three, top four in each class, and um, they choose 30 people, and then they choose an alternates list. So Judy, 
if it looked warm in that video, I just want to let you know it was even hotter than it looked. And those kids kept it cool and collected, much unlike the four the <laughs> across the fence team that was there filming them. And it was very impressive. So all in all, it sounds like it was a pretty good year. It was. It was a great year. All right. Well, thanks so much for coming in and sharing that with us. And that's our program for today. I'm Judy Simpson. I'll see you again next time on Across the Fence. Thank you.